Wow. So before we get started, uh, let me share. Uh, I welcome Shelley Parks to the stage, our Missouri Teacher of the Year. And she works. <laughs> and she works as an English teacher at Francis Howard North High School. So Shelley, thank you for joining us today and thank offering you so much. us your perspective. So my first question is to you. So we just heard from two titans in the field mm -hmm. around issues of ex education and equity. And I'm curious, uh, how do you respond to what you heard from both Michael and from Howard? Yeah, I think my initial reaction is just um, the, the dialogue, the rich dialogue in this room and the heart behind the love for kids is so impactful. And my fear is that the things that people see who aren't in this room are the headlines, right? And so then as teachers, we feel deeply about those headlines that say American students are failing because teaching is so personal. And so um, I just, I wish everybody was in the room to hear the additional facets of the dialogue, but thank you. And, and we heard a lot of dialogue today. We heard a lot of passion this morning and, and into this afternoon. And you've traveled across the state of Missouri. I have. And you've seen some of the evidence of some of the promising practices that were shared by both of our speakers. And I'm curious, what, what have you seen that gives you hope uh, that we're on a path towards some success in the future? Yeah, Missouri students are doing great things. I mean, for one example, I read a school in, in our state, the students were commissioned by the Air Force to make a part that cost them $1.50 for a B-2 bomber, and <laughs> it is saving our Air Force $10 billion. That's Missouri students. Wow. Yeah. $10 billion. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. So then let me ask you this, as, as I, and I'm asking the whole panel this discussion. So Howard, we listened to the concerns that you shared. We've got to do better as an organization, as a state, as a, as a country, as a world, we have to do better for our kids. And one of the things that you shared as you were talking earlier was how do we make kids feel welcome in their schools? And so I would love for you to share a bit more in, at, at your school how does that look? What does that feel like? Uh, say a bit more, if you will. And then, Shelley, I would love for you to follow up with some examples right. that you may have seen okay. as well. Yeah, you know, I, first of all, I, I, I want people to understand how grateful I am and how much respect I have for people who go into these buildings every day <laughs> and work with these kids. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of us who run around talking who really have no idea what that's really like <laughs> every day single day. And what I would say is that when you come to our school, uh, because it's a small school, number one, we don't have security guards, we don't have metal detectors, we don't have none of that. And I told our kids that the day that we have to have that is the day that the school should shut down. Mm. And especially since they named the school after me. And I told people <laughs> that, if it, <laughs> that if it ever gets to the point where it becomes something else other than a citadel of love for our kids. If I'm not here, I'm going to haunt every single person <laughs> <laughs> that is in the school. And so I do think that there's a way that you can make, feel, make kids feel welcome. Now, it's, it's like how you greet them at the door. Mm -hmm. It's like knowing their names. It's like knowing their backstories. Yes. It's like taking five minutes to ask why are you looking like that today? You know, like, you know, what, you know, what's going on with you? But you can only do that if you actually know the kids. Right, and right. you know that when they look a certain kind of way, there's something going on, right? right? But sometimes it's not giving them counseling. Sometimes it's just taking five minutes for them to say, you know what, my brother did this to me <laughs> last night and et cetera. So, there are little things that we can yeah. do no, I that I think that. help no, with that. I appreciate that. I, and Shelly, you've probably seen some examples of this. Yeah, I'd love, yeah. yeah I'd love to tell you about a story. Um, so Dr. Hostetler is a principal at Francis Hall North, where I teach. And we have been talking about honoring dignity of students. And one of the activities that we did is to put up all students' pictures in a hallway of our high school. This was on a professional development day. And we went through as a staff, and we put a check mark if we knew the kid's name, and we put a dot if we knew their story. Mm. And then at the end of that, we saw students who didn't have check marks and didn't have dots, and we said, we've got to be intentional about reaching out to these kids. Mm. They deserve us to know their story. That's how you honor their dignity. Oh, that's powerful. That's, that's powerful. And it's a specific data informed right. process mm -hmm. to let you know that you're connecting to all students. Right. 
And I think what we heard implicit and explicit in some of your comments was the importance of parent engagement. Mm. And so, Michael, I'm wondering, as, as you think about the role parents play yeah. in our reform efforts, uh, Howard mentioned it a bit. Uh, you implicitly stated the importance of parent participation. Mm -hmm. What would you offer as some, some uh, suggestions for us as educators on how we engage parents in this process? Oh, I've got a lot of ideas about that <laughs> with, my, uh, with my own two sons. I can only uh, imagine. You can imagine my, the, the poor principal at, at my kid's <laughs> school. Look, I... I think what we have to remember, and I, and I live it every day, is that it is really hard as a parent. My mm -hmm. kids go to a traditional public school, and it is really hard to feel like you know what's going on or that you have any, a, a, any way to act when you see things that aren't going right. Yeah. Uh, and so whatever you can do as educators to make sure that parents feel like there's an open door uh, and that, that you want their... Uh, you want their input, and mm -hmm. that they probably have good ideas, that they're seeing things that you might not see. Mm -hmm. I also think, look, we, you know, we've had this big shift, as I talked about earlier, in reaching higher to higher standards. And in doing so, when you look at the state tests, we now have defined something like 60 or 70 percent of kids, depending on the state, as being below grade level, as, as not being proficient. Uh, and that lines up with what we see in the national assessment. Now, th that, that's hard news to take. But yeah. what it means is that those kids are not yet on track for graduating from high school and being able to hit the ground running for post-secondary education or, or a good-paying job. We need to get them on track. But parents, if you ask parents, is your own child on track? Is your own, grade, is your own child on grade level? You know what percentage of parents will say yes nationally? 90%. Ninety percent. How is that? And I think when you unpack it, you know, it's, it's because, you know, for, for many reasons, they see the test score and maybe they don't put too much, maybe they don't see the test score for one thing, maybe they don't put too much value in it. Maybe they ask their child's teacher, should they put value in this test score? And the teacher says no. Maybe it's because the grades they're seeing are, are maybe a little ele more elevated than they should be. Maybe particularly in, in high poverty schools, we're a little too willing to give kids you know, a B for trying, uh, and, and now we've given that parent an indication that their child's doing fine, when really the parents should know there's an issue. There, there's, they should be concerned, uh, and we need to talk about how to, how to get uh, this child back on track. So I just think we need to be really thoughtful and aware of, of the messages we're sending to parents and be willing to be courageous. And, and if children are not on track, be willing to tell their parents the truth. I think... You know, talking about parents, though, having been on the other end of being cussed out. I mean, the reality is that sometimes when parents roll up into the building, man, they're not, you know, you're not trying to hear this, man, and, and, and the way they're coming at you. And so the respect for parents is to be respectful when they're not being respectful. And that's real. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. and, you know, in a lot of buildings and people come there mad because you done done this to my child. And, but, and, and to be able to, like, negotiate that. Yeah. Is, 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 is something that, you know, maybe a number of people out here have faced, you know, particularly people who are, are, are school leaders or even teachers. So, so this, this idea of, of not only how to engage parents, but more important, how do we empower parents? Nice. Yeah. And, 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 and how do we deal with parents who are angry? And a lot of times, because I remember one time I got cussed out, there's been a number of times, I knew for a fact that I was... What she was cursing me out about had nothing to do with why she was cursing me out. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Right. It was, it was yeah. I just happened to be the one yep. that day. And what she unloaded on was a whole bunch of stuff that didn't have nothing to do with the issue. It was everything that was going on with her. Uh, but, I, but, I, but as difficult it was, I took it. And, 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 and we were able to calm it down. But if I'd have gone to it, then the whole thing would have, yeah. you know, exploded. No, I like that distinction you make between involvement of parents and empowerment of parents. And I think that's a, a, a powerful distinction. And this, keep in mind, this is a professional learning conference. So we see professional learning as a vehicle for bringing about those equitable outcomes for our students and those opportunities. Because we believe that if we have powerful teachers in front of every child, and every child has access to that powerful teaching as part of their experience every day, then we start to see some of the positive trends that I think we all want on this stage. So I, a question for all of you, from your perspectives, what do you see as the power of or the opportunities within this conversation around professional learning uh, to support some of the changes that we'd all like to see? 
And Shelley, I'll start with you. Well, I just think teachers need to be encouraged and given opportunities to grow in leadership. A lot of times, um, just I think that teachers, if you want to grow in leadership, it's about getting out of the classroom mm -hmm. instead of growing while you stay in. And so I would like to see teacher leaderships at a systems level be able to help grow teachers who can stay in those classrooms and do the work with kids. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Now, I, I would say, look, we, we have a moment right now. You, you may have noticed that things in Washington are a little dysfunctional. <laughs> that, that, that ring a bell with anybody? Well, a little bit. Uh, a little bit. Okay. Little bit. So, uh, and, and that is, look, that's happening in many states, too, that our politics are, are pretty dysfunctional right now. The good news about that is that we are not in a mode where policymakers are coming up with brand new policies every other year, mm -hmm. right? And suddenly, this, you know, we have to respond to this move and that move. Things are fairly stable in a lot of places. That gives us an opportunity to finish what we started. And what we started was this shift to the higher standards. The work is around curriculum and around professional learning. It's, it's that intersection. Okay. It's how do we make sure that you've selected a great aligned curriculum right, to the standards, uh, and that you are working day in and day out and helping teachers understand that curriculum better and better. I think, and, and uh, educators I respect think, that if you do that right, you can throw the standards out the window. Mm. Okay, you don't need the standard on the, bo on the board, standard 1475. You don't need to forget the standard, focus on the curriculum. If you've picked mm. a great curriculum and teach that curriculum with passion and with craft, and, and we're off and running. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I tease a lot of our young teachers because they, you know, all run around calling each other awesome. Hell, everybody ain't awesome. <laughs> you, know I mean? like, you know, a lot of us are just like regular people, right? <laughs> and so, so for me, the issue is how do you get awesome results mm. with regular people? Yeah. And so I think one of the ways of doing that is uh, the, the time that you set aside for professional development. So at our school, every Wednesday afternoon is half day because we do professional development every Wednesday afternoon. Because when I was superintendent, I thought what we passed off as in-service was a hoax. You know, this idea that you get teachers together or twice a semester or some great principal decides we're going to have professional development on Friday afternoon. <laughs> I mean, who comes up with this, man? <laughs> <laughs> like, so, so to me, like a part of if we're really going to do professional development is giving teachers consistent time every week to get better at their practice. Because if you don't do that, no, no other profession does professional development like schools. Because people know that that's stupid. You can't bring people together <laughs> like once a semester or you can't send somebody to Utah, and the only way you know they went to Utah was you got you to gotta take their class. And then when they come back, there ain't no time for them to, to tell you anything that they learned in Utah. And because whatever they learned in Utah, once they get back and deal with real kids, whatever they learn, there's a problem. And since there ain't nobody there to correct that, they go back to doing what they knew, even though it didn't work. So at some point, if we believe people are professionals, we got to treat them like they're professionals and really give them uh, the attention that they deserve. So as we come to the end of our time together, I'm going to ask you all to leave us with a final thought, uh, something that connects to the message that you've shared or something else that you'd like us to leave this room thinking about uh, as it relates to issues of equity and excellence for all of our students. Uh, I'll let you start, Howard, and we'll work our way down. <laughs> no, I, I, I would just say that every single child that we can save is precious. Because not one of us in this room knows what saving that one child will mean to that child, his or her family, or to the world. Thank you. You can see why I didn't want to follow Howard today. <laughs> Look, uh, I talked a lot about the impact of the Great Recession and poverty. I just want to be clear that uh, even though we know uh, schools can't do it all, you know, and, and that issues outside of schools have a big impact, the question we have to keep asking ourselves is, are schools doing all they can? Is my school doing all it can for the kids under 
our charge? And am I 100% certain that I've got the best curriculum, the most aligned materials, and that I'm providing the support that educators need? Uh, if the answers to those questions aren't yes, we, we've got some more work to do. Thank you. Okay. And Shelley. Missouri Commissioner Van Dieven said yesterday that we can't have successful schools without successful teachers. And so um, I would urge people to spend time on recruitment and retention of teachers because we've all seen the numbers and they're scary. And every one of our kids, research shows that if our kids are going to achieve, it's a successful, high-quality teacher in front of them. So I think we need to invest in teachers. Spend some more time with them. Thank you. Well, first of all, let me just say a couple of things. One, I know we could talk for hours on this provocative conversation, so thank you all. And the other thing I want to say is, I need to borrow both y'all socks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at these socks, and I'm Steve thinking there's some <laughs> real <laughs> style <laughs> yeah. sock here. So we'll, chat, we'll talk about that later. But please thank or join me in thanking our speakers today. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.